morning, everyone. Uh, my talk today is going to be on fine wire frame management in tibial pylon or platform fractures. Um, I'd like to give a ma massive thanks to Mr. Harris for helping me with this talk, particularly providing me with some clinical photos and x-rays that you'll, you'll see soon. So this is the content I'm hoping to get through today um, regarding this topic. So tibial pylon fractures, also known as plafond fractures, are relatively uncommon um, fractures. They account for about 5 to 7% of tibia fractures and about less than 1% of all lower limb injuries. However, the reason why they're so important is that these fractures are extremely complex uh, due to the sheer comminution and the varying fracture patterns that can account um, depending on how the fracture actually occurred, where the foot uh, position was of the actual leg uh, when the injury occurred. These are often secondary to an, an axial injury where the talus, where the talus actually rams into the tibial plafond and they develop an extremely um, comminuted fracture pattern with, um, with significant articular injury and a metaphyseal um, shear as well up through the metaphysis of the bone. And they're usually secondary to something like high energy mechanisms, such as um, such as a fall from height or a motor vehicle accident. Because of these high energy mechanisms, they're usually associated with other injuries, and this is something that needs to be considered when you're assessing for a tibial platform fracture. Um, and they they do have associated injuries um, with open fractures, um, associated with ipsilateral injuries on the on the same limb. Um, as, or even um, bilateral pylon fractures is being um, recounted in the literature as well. A pylon fracture usually, usually not only does it involve the metaphysis and the articular surface, but it also what, what makes a pylon special and unique is it has a significant soft tissue component to the injury as well. And this is what makes this particular fracture so hard, uh, such a hard injury to treat. In terms of clinical assessment, as with all traumas, particularly with these high energy mechanisms, we need to assess them using a trauma lens, uh, using EMSC principle to assess and make sure that the patient, um, that this is an isolated injury for the patient. Um, and this includes checking the patient's C-spine, uh, ABCDs, and also the pelvis. And we wanna make sure that there's no other concurrent injury that has occurred from this patient's mechanism and provide them with the adequate resuscitation. The history is then performed and in particular, we wanna find out about the mechanism itself. Uh, the, fasting status, the fasting status of the patient and any pertinent comorbidities for, um, for theater. A thorough examination needs to be performed once when, when, when able, uh, particularly looking at the surrounding soft tissue um, around the ankle joint, um, as well as joint above below. Um, as these are associated with open injuries, these need to be looked for um, and early antibiotics and tetanus needs to be prov provided if it turns out to be open. The neurovascular ass assessment needs to be done. And even though it is rarer for this fracture pattern, also an assessment for compartment syndrome. Following all of this, the patient should be splinted in NLGs um, and then, and then uh, X-rays, uh, orthogonal X-rays and CTs obtained. And then the discussion needs to be made because these fractures are often, um, are often either displaced and tend to the, along the soft tissue, or they're often extremely shortened. And regardless, they're, they're causing significant damage to the soft tissue until they're reduced. And the reduction needs to be considered. And the discussion, the, the reduction of where this patient has it, whether it's in ED or in emergency, sorry, ED or in the theater, needs to be discussed with um, the consultant, whether or not we think that a reduction can be done in the emergency department and the plaster Paris put on, um, or whether or not this patient actually needs to come upstairs to theatre and um, actually have an x fix put on to take the soft tissue tension um, off or take the bone off the soft tissue tension. Regarding the management options, we know non-operative management, there's very narrow indication for this particular um, fracture pattern. 
Um, and regarding the definitive management, this has actually changed over time. So I think it's important to understand the history um, of the management options throughout the time and to see how we manage these patients now. So appeal on fracture was first described in 1911 by Etienne Destot, who was a French radiologist. The term peel on is French for pestle. And at the time, this was sort of likened to the talus being a pestle and in a plafond, in a plafond injury or peel on injury, the talus would be driven into the tibial plafond, just like a pestle is driven into a mortar. Um, peel on fractures were notoriously difficult fractures to treat early on. Um, both operatively, but also conservatively as well. Early on, when operative fixation was used, um, people found that there was a significantly high complication rate of deep infection, non-union, and ultimately amputation for these patients. So due to the complex fracture pattern, uh, due to the poorly damaged soft tissue surrounding the area and reduced blood flow, um, in the early days, due to that compl the ongoing complication, um, ma uh, management for conservative management was actually the mainstay up until about the mid 1950s. However, with conservative management, what this meant was these patients would then go on to have post traumatic arthritis and have a significant debilitating pain and functional deficit. It wasn't until not around 1968 where Rudy and Algar published a series on 84 pilon fractures um, with fantastic results from this cohort. And, um, and that was using um, an operative technique. And it was only then where there was consideration of potentially the pendulum swinging back to um, doing an operation for these patients. Rudy and Algar recorded that 74% of their patients were pain free pain-free, 90% have returned to previous occupation and only 5% of deep infections. They, from their publication, they um, surmised that there were four principles that needed to be upheld to treat these particular injuries um, and this fracture pattern. And those were to firstly restore the fibular link, provide an anatomic articular reduction, then filling in the bone defect following the reduction, and then finally stabilizing the medial column with the medial buttress plate. However, when other surgeons tried to replicate this technique, their results were not reproducible, um, and they continued to have these high complication rates. The theory was that the majority of patients, about 70% of patients in Rudy and Algor's paper were actually of a lower mechanism skiing injury, which is not generalizable to the, to the crash and bash cohort um, of patients that were managed by other authors. And thus, then the realization and the, um, of respect in the soft tissue was starting to really garner um, the importance of this by authors, um, particularly in this high energy cohort of car crashes and fall from heights. Rudy and Orgola released a classification system here, and essentially that it's a classification system um, based on displacement um, and x-rays. And it is also, also is a prognostication uh, classification where type one is no displacement or little displacement to the articular surface. Type two is as displacement at the articular surface. And then type three is more of a compression type fracture um, into the tibial diaphys uh, metaphysis itself. So this led to the popularity of treatment with X fixes um, definitively with the natural progression being that of a limited internal fixation with a definitive X fix. Uh, a limited internal fixation was a principle of anatomically reducing the articular surface utilizing minimally invasive techniques such as percutaneous screws, um, and then providing a relative reduction to correct the malalignment to the metaphysis itself. And whilst the X fix led to a rapid drop in the rates of severe complications um, and a limited internal fixation reduced the risk of post-traumatic arthritis, um, there were still negatives of about having an X fix, but that was being bulky, cumbersome, having cosmetic issues for the patient, 
and, and also an increased rate of pin site infection. It was in about 1999 that the seminal paper by Sirkin was published um, into the literature, introducing the idea of a staged approach to fixing these fractures, what they described as a span, scan and plan approach. <clears throat> This particular approach saw rapid improvement in how we treated these fractures, uh, which was only made better with thus the uh, introduction of locking plates and further techniques and improving our technology, such as MECO technique. And so the internal fixation has since made the comeback, the pendulum has swung back, and the X fix has been left behind. So the question now remains is there still a role for an X fix? And this is why I think Mr. Harris would say. In the, in, on limbreconstructions.com, I found a, a quote that I thought was fairly nice. Um, Mr. Krokovich is a UK orthopedic consultant. And he said, if the fracture can be fixed without an increased risk of infection, delayed union or non-union, or the fracture pattern allows, then he would always choose to orif it. Otherwise, it would X fix the fracture. And I spoke to Mr. Harris, um, and he gave me a more elegant quote to put in this talk, and that is that he would put an X fix on any case that can't or won't be internally fixed by my colleagues. So, why choose an X fix? Of course, they have a wider utility than just managing acute fractures. Um, the general principles of when to choose an X fix is whether it's an acute or a chronic issue. Um, of course, we know X fixes are great for um, stabilizing fractures whilst there's a significant soft tissue injury going on, whether it be swelling, open fracture, or there's neurovascular concerns. Uh, X fixes are fantastic for temporizing someone, particularly if they're in shock um, or they have had a high multi system injury um, to avoid them having that second hit to begin with whilst they're um, being resuscitated. And the X fixes are great for fractures that have a very difficult fracture pattern, such as that with significant comminution or bone loss, or those that are intra-articular that aren't actually amenable to open reduction. But we also know that X-fixes are fantastic for treating for infections, deformity corrections, and also have been used for arthrodesis as well. So in regards to what X-fix to choose, this talk is mainly about fine wire frames and thus ring X-fixes, however, I just wanted to sort of briefly talk about the different types of X fixes. So the uniplanar X fix is essentially um, the one that we'll probably use most commonly, particularly in the acute setting, uh, where we put half pins into a patient's cortical bone, um, aiming to get by cortical fit, um, and along the subcutaneous border um, of the tibia. And these half pins are connected to the clamps, which are thus connected to rods. Just briefly, for just briefly to recount the principles, um, ways to increase the stability for this type of X fix is to either increase the diameter of the pin, increase the number of pins used, increase the spread of the pins, increase the diameter of the rods, or increasing the number of rods. You can also decrease the bone to rod distance, such as that, or you increase the pin to fracture distance as well or sorry, decrease the pin to fracture distance. And the other way to do it is to increase the number of planes. So this is a biplanar X fix that's seen. However, this is a ring fixator, and this is um, what is what would be the management of choice for a more definitive fracture of the tibial pylon. Now, there are multiple reasons as to why, to, why one would choose a planar frame or a ring frame. And the main thing I want to talk about with the planar frame is the concept of cantilever effect. So the pros of a planar frame is you get good fixation in, into the di um, diaphysis. Um, and so they're good, and particularly with, that, with um, subcutaneous border of the tibia, they're good for temporizing measures. However, they're not good for multiple reasons for a more definitive fixation. Half pins are less strong in the cantalis bone. They're quite thick and unlikely to be able to be inserted into a distal fragment for a tibial pylon fracture. And the bi main biomechanical drawback is that it's called the cantilever effect. So 
the cantilever effect is is where we liken these half pins to a diving board and and when there's weight being put through the leg um, whether that be gravity or a patient's body weight the the rings will act similarly to a diving board where the load that goes through the bone will result in a shear force that comes across the fracture uh, which is unfortunately not inducive to fracture healing Uh, but this type of scenario is where the ring fixator excels. So the ring frame was pioneered by Gavril Ilozarov in the 1950s in Siberia uh, when he managed World War II veterans in remote Siberia. Uh, the ring frame uses the principles of a beam fixation and has been likened to the spokes of a wheel with the bone being the hub of the wheel, the rings and then the rims being the um, the ring the ring being the rim of the wheel and then the wires themselves being the, the spokes the concept is that the crossing fine wire through the bone and then being and then they get tensioned onto a ring over multiple levels and the bone is thus suspended on the wires like this person is walking on this tie rope this allows for a strong fixation, particularly with, within cancellous bone, and is particularly useful in the tibial plafond where the thin wires can be directly threaded through the plafond fracture and thus having a direct reduction and hold of the fracture itself. Whilst the benefits are immense, um, as the biomechanics allow for weight bearing and also protects um, forces, shear forces whilst encouraging axial micromotion, the risks of this type of fixation is demonstrated here. With a non-threaded wire, it's possible for the bone to slide along the wire, which is why the ideal situation is that we have crossing wires um, to allow multi-directional stability. And these should ideally be perpendicular. However, we know we have to compromise to doing this because of the neurovascular structures that run down the limb. The way that we comp compromise is that we have a more acute crossing angle. However, this is, is less. Um, however, this is less stable from a multi-directional point of view, and so the way we get around that is putting olive pins uh, or having um, wires have olive pins that help buttress the bone together or in the spot. The real magic of the ring frame happens at the fracture site. Whilst a planar X fix is prone to the cantilever effect, uh, Rilov Zarov described something that was, that was coined the trampoline effect, which is where with load through the bone, there's an increase, um, there's a deceleration of the bone uh, because the load tightens the wires. And then when the load is reduced, there's a acceleration of the bone uh, as the wires get stretched and this creates a trampolining kind of effect and thus axial micromotion at the fracture site which is also a low shear environment and this is quite advantageous for fracture healing and so here's a summary of the benefits of a ring frame so to avoid cantilever and have the trampoline effect it's more stable and cancellous bone improves multi-planar stability allows for load sharing and weight bearing through and and also particularly in tibial platform fractures ky's are able to be threaded through the fracture site itself however the issues are that you can transfix soft tissue and we know particularly um, in the mid tibia that you can transfix muscle and skin um, and obviously we want to try to avoid the neurovascular structures um, but all, the main thing is it's so bulky. And this is when a hybrid hybrid might be might come into play and has been used in the past. And that is where you sort of try to get the best of the both worlds. And you're putting half pins in metaphysis at, over the subcutaneous border and then fine wire through the epiphysis, particularly where the fracture is. Um, and, and it has the benefits of both types of systems. And so the idea is then you hold the fracture until the, the union is achieved and you can take off the uh, take off the frame. Um, but of course, whilst the fracture, whilst the frame is there, we want to try to avoid complications and you know, pin site, pin site um, infections are common and pin site care needs to be meticulous. 
Um, frames can be difficult to manage, particularly because they're so bulky. And so this is something that the patient needs to be educated on and checked up on regularly. And they need to be seeing physiotherapy to avoid stiffening up any adjacent joints and um, avoid contractions of any muscles, particularly in the ankle. So they need to be actually moving. And this is a united plafond fracture. Now, in terms of outcomes of tibial plafond fractures, I think in the literature, there's a paucity of um, data um, that specifically compares um, the ex external fixation groups with um, internal fixation groups. Um, these are some of the uh, outcomes that has been documented in the literature. Uh, Lovisetti described 100% union in a closed um, OTC type C. Um, so that's a, that's a type three comminuted plafond fracture, although they did have a widespread of functional outcomes. So there was many outcomes that were poor and fair as well as some that were also good, but no significant complications. And then Tibet um, did a, a review in 2021 of, 70, of uh, 58 patients um, who had open pill on fractures and found they had a moderate union rate initially with a lower in deep infection rate compared to um, that in the literature um, for an internal fixation at the time. However, I think it's important to realize that it's actually quite difficult to quantify the outcome of this particular procedure comparing it to internal fixation. We know particularly with the success of the staged approach with locking plates that most would probably choose to internally fix. Um, the two groups of patients that would be better treated with an ORF, and then there's a second separate group that probably would be better treated with um, an X-fix. And I'd, I'd almost say these are completely different groups, uh, uh, um, oranges and apples. So it's important to recognize that when we look at the literature for this, that there's an inherent selection bias when it comes to patients who've had hex fixes, because often they're more complex fractures, um, they're and more of a terrible injury that may not be amenable to fixation. So, um, or they might have sustained an open injury as well. This was one study that I did find that does look at the particular question and that was published in 2015. Um, they found nine studies, um, was published in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery and it was a systematic review with meta-analyses. And they found nine studies of, from three databases, um, of which nine of those studies, three were actually RCTs and the rest were retrospective cohort studies. And from the 498 fractures overall, they didn't find any difference between the two groups, whether that be infection, union, non-union, male union, or arthritis. But they did recognize that this was a small cohort and that um, probably larger um, studies are required to look at this particular question. Thank you.